Hello everyone, this is Dr. Stevens, and what I'd like to do here is introduce the poem Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold, uh, and by introduce I simply mean a couple of things. First of all, I just want to read through it and then perhaps say a few words about the poem, and also this obviously is addressed to people who might be new to the poem not addressed to those of you who have read the poem and studied it and so on, but I'm thinking mostly of people for uh, whom this poem is still a fairly new experience. So I'm going to read through. Now, remember that hearing a poem, reading it out loud so that you hear it, is one of the most important ways of understanding a poem. As a matter of fact, a lot of people would say it's the very first thing you need to do when you approach a poem for the first time and are trying to understand it, read it out loud, listen to somebody else uh, reading it out loud, hear the poem. Because the sound of the poem is intimately connected with its meaning. So I'm going to read, but first of all, by the way, just uh, you might want to take a note of that uh, picture. You might see a picture accompanying this uh, Tegrity class or Tegrity lecture. That is a picture of Dover Beach. Uh, in the background of that picture, you'll see the uh, cliffs of Dover. This is uh, Dover is on the southeast coast of England, and uh, those cliffs are referred to in the poem. So let's get started. Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray, where the sea meets the moon-blanched land, listen. You hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand, begin and cease, and then again begin with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long withdrawing roar, retreating, to the breath of the night wind, down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another, for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. So, how are you going to approach this poem? How are you going to read it? How are you going to understand it? Well, the first thing is to simply note what is literally in the text of the poem itself. So, for example, I'll say, oh, that's one of the things, sorry, we've got to get, this, get these pens working here. All right, let's choose a color. Okay, let's choose a pen. See if we got it now. Okay. No, we don't get it. Hang on, folks. Got pens. 
choosing the color. All right, let's see what we got. Well, son of a gun. All right, sorry for the interruption there, folks. Uh, I think we've got this pen thing working now. So, the C. What do we notice in the poem? What is simply literally on the surface of the text? We've got the sea. Don't read too much into the sea. Somebody is telling us that the sea is calm. We have no reason to read into this anything more than the fact that we've got a sea, an ocean. All right. Um, is it a metaphor? Well, maybe. We don't know yet. Is it a symbol of something? Yeah, maybe. We don't know yet. But my point is simply don't read too much into it. First of all, simply assume that whoever it is that's speaking here, let's for the sake of convenience say that it's Arnold, all right? Let's simply assume that Arnold is telling us or telling somebody that the sea is calm. So we can assume, all right, he's looking at the sea. And he goes on, so he goes on to describe more of what he is seeing, all right? He sees the sea is calm, he sees it's high tide, the tide is full, he sees the moon, the moon is lying fair upon the straits, all right? Straits would be a narrow passage in the ocean, in the sea, right? Now, French coast, all right, well, what's the French coast doing here? Well, I happen to know something about... Dover and the southeast coast of England and so on. So I happen to know that uh, if you are standing uh, on the beach at Dover or maybe on the cliffs above the beach, you can look across the sea. And by the way, in this case, it's the sea is the English Channel. You can look across the sea and you can see the coast of France and you can see this light, presumably a a lighthouse of some sort that is gleaming, that is flashing, all right? But suppose you don't know, all right? Suppose you don't know anything about where Dover is and how you can see the French coast across the English Channel and so on. Well, okay, so you simply note, okay, well, there's a French coast here, all right? Okay, and we've got cliffs, and we've got and the cliffs are glimmering and vast, all right? You say to yourself, what does that mean, glimmering? Okay, glimmering means they're shining. These cliffs, again, you might not know this, all right? These cliffs are white. And because they're chalk, all right? Because they are chalk cliffs and white chalk, and so they are shining in the moonlight. But what's the point here? The point is, don't try to understand everything that you see in the poem, but take note of it. Take note of the fact that we've got cliffs, we've got cliffs that are glimmering and so on, um, and we're seeing them across or standing out there in the bay, all right? This would be the bay, all right, near or at Dover Beach. So... What have we got so far? I'm asking you what you would do or what you can do if you are new to this poem, looking at it for the first time. What are you going to see? At the very least, you can see that Arnold is describing this landscape. He's describing what he sees. And then, right? And then he describes what he can hear. So we've got the sense of seeing here, right? And we've got the sense of hearing. And what is he hearing? He's hearing a roar. Well, you know what a roar is, all right? Maybe you've never been to the ocean in your life, but you know what the sound that we call roar is. Uh, you probably know what pebbles are, and so you see, okay, well, he's hearing the waves on the beach, on the pebbles of the beach, drawing them back and then throwing them back up on the beach again, and so on. So don't make too much of this. 
Arnold is seeing certain things like the moon and the tide and the cliffs, and he is hearing certain things like the waves hitting the beach. Here is where we need to start to maybe think a little bit. Okay, this I'm going to say all of this here, just take this literally. A literal sea, that is something you can see and hear, literal cliffs, literal moonlight, and so on, okay? Don't read too much into it, because it's here that Arnold starts to ask us to think, all right? Here we are hearing something, the roar of the sea, and what is the roar of the sea doing? Okay, it is bringing in this note of sadness. That is where you start to think about the meaning of the poem. Now, the sea makes a sound. The sea doesn't come along and tell the person standing there on the beach, hey, I'm sad now, right? It's the observer who hears the sadness. And that's the important thing. Somebody else might come along and hear that same sound as Arnold is hearing and might say, oh, that's a very soothing sound. I really like the sound. Or that sound really, really puts me to sleep. Whatever it might be. But here we get to what you might call the interpretation of what Arnold is telling us. And this interpretation is pretty simple. Arnold hears the sound of the sea and he says it's sad. Sound equals sad and that's a theme we need to pay attention to. Let's go on. We have Sophocles and you say, oh my goodness. Sophocles, Sophocles, that sounds like a name I've heard before, or maybe I haven't heard it before, and heard it on the Aegean, all right, the Aegean, uh, I think I might remember that from geography class, that's another ocean somewhere over there near the Mediterranean Sea, you might say, all right, or you might say Sophocles, got no idea, Aegean, have no idea what that is, okay, but... You can use your head. Sophocles heard it. Okay? So, well, somebody or something is hearing it. Don't worry about Sophocles now. If you want to go to Google and Google Sophocles, then do it. If you want to Google Aegean and find out what Aegean means, do it. That's great. But let's pay attention to the important things. What is it? that Sophocles heard. Okay, he heard it. It's a pronoun. Pronouns refer to something else. What is it then that has been mentioned, right? What's been mentioned up here that might be it? Okay, now, well, what did Arnold hear? Arnold heard the roar, didn't he? Okay, so Sophocles heard the roar right? And Arnold also heard, right? He heard in that sound, he heard the sadness, didn't he? Okay, so the question is, well, did this Sophocles hear it also? All right, well, whoever this Sophocles is, Arnold is telling us that this sound brought into his mind human misery. Well, there's something sad about that, too. So we've got a connection here. We've got a connection here. But let's not get too hung up on Sophocles and who he was and the Aegean and what he might have heard and so on. You can do some research if you'd like. If you're reading an anthology of English literature, you've probably got some notes that will tell you about Sophocles and the Aegean and what Sophocles heard and so on. But let's keep the big picture in mind, okay? We, we find a thought. We who are hearing it, okay, again, back to the fact that 
that we've got some hearing going on here. We hear it by this distant northern sea. So here's our focus in capital letters. We go from this um, description of a landscape at night, the sea, to this thought. And what I'm going to say is, all right, this, is, this looks like what we need to be focusing on. And so I'm going to suggest that in the rest of the poem, what Arnold has done is he has moved from this description, literal description of the ocean, to the note of sadness, to this particular thought. He's focusing on this thought, and we're going to say, what is this thought? All right. It has something to do with faith. Now, we're moving from the literal to the figurative, right? The sea is no longer just the literal ocean, in this case, the English Channel. The sea has become a metaphor for faith, the life of faith. We're talking about religious faith, right? So the sea is faith. And now, the sea of faith is a girdle around the earth, okay? Now, a girdle is simply something that goes around something, like a belt or a sash, right? That would go around something. That's what girdle means. It goes around something. Well, the sea goes around the earth. We know the earth is mostly ocean, right? And so what Arnold is saying simply is that faith goes around the earth, okay? And it was at the full. So you need to ask yourself, what does it mean for the sea of faith to be at the full? Go back to the beginning, right? Go back to the beginning, and what does Arnold say? The tide is full. You say, oh, yeah, 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 the sea. The sea is tidal, right? It gets low and it gets high. The tide comes in, the tide goes out. So at one point, one point, faith was high tide. Well, notice that he's talking in the past tense. It was. It was high. It was full. The implication now is that faith is no longer high. All right. So what does he do? He is hearing again. Right? But this is no longer a literal hearing. Again, we're moving from the literal to the figurative. He is hearing what? He is hearing a roar. But what is it the roar of? It is the long withdrawing roar of faith. Faith withdraws. Okay, and the withdrawing is a roar. So ask yourself, I'll leave this up to you, ask yourself, in what way would faith, it's figurative, right? It's not literal, you don't literally hear faith withdrawing, but in what way could we say that the withdrawing or the decline of faith might be roaring? Okay. Let's conclude with the conclusion of the poem. Faith is withdrawing. Faith is going, going out, right, away like the time.
and this would be the ebb tide, the ebb tide being the tide that goes out, that goes away, the water going away. So he says, Ah, love, let us be true to one another. Okay? We need to be true. Why? Okay? Why true? And what does he mean by true? Let's be faithful to each other. Let's be loyal. Let's not betray each other. Why? Because, because the world, and this is pretty dark, folks. Arnold is saying the, jo the world is no longer joyful, is no longer loving, is no longer light. It doesn't have any certainty. There's nothing that we can be sure of or certain of. There's no peace. And when there is pain, there's no help for our pain. It's pretty grim, isn't it, right? It's grim. It's a very grim view of the world that Arnold is presenting here. Why is it grim? Because no faith. So what do we have left? You can love me. I can love you. And... The suggestion is that when we've got these ignorant armies clashing by night, they don't, they can't even see what they're doing. When we've got a situation like that, the best we can do is to love each other. So that's it, folks. Thanks for listening. A little introduction to Dover Beach and what you need to be looking at when you read this poem.